All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, it's good to see you all. So we, as a church family, have been going through the book of Luke. If you've been with us any length of time, you're aware of that. We've been going through that for almost two years now, I think, maybe a year and a half. Um, and so we are getting near the end. We are in the spot, which is Jesus's last week on earth before he dies and, and goes, to the or goes to the cross and, and dies and resurrects. And so this week, known as Holy Week, which we normally read about leading up to Easter, so it's been interesting to think about as we're going into Christmas. Um, we will be taking a break from Luke as in December as we, um, as we celebrate Advent together. But um, for now, like I said, we're in Holy Week leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection. So in the last few weeks, we've seen him come into Jerusalem on a donkey, right? He drove sellers out of temple courts. And most recently, we've heard about a few interactions where um, teachers of the law, where scribes, where Sadducees have been trying to kind of trap Jesus in his words. They've been asking him these questions where they've been trying to trap him really so they can have some sort of tangible evidence so they can arrest him and then kill him legally, right? And every time Jesus is asked these questions, which are meant to, to trap him in his words, he has this response that causes them to be speechless. They, he, he is not trapped. He is not fooled by what they're trying to do. And instead, he responds in a way where they, where they don't know what to say. And so here, where we are today, we are seeing Jesus' response to that series of questioning, those series of trying to trap him in his words. Um, and so where we're picking up today, if you want to turn there or I'll read aloud, is Luke chapter 20, verse 41. says, then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. How many of you have ever seen the TV show Friends? Anyone? Some of you? Okay. Then this might be a familiar scene to you. But basically, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a show about six friends living in New York City, three guys, three girls. It's a sitcom, so there's always some fun to be had. Um, but in the Thanksgiving episode, one year, one of the girls, who knows nothing about cooking or baking to save her life, she decides to make a dessert for their Thanksgiving feast. She decides to make a traditional English trifle. So she makes this whole dessert. It's a layered dessert. And they cut to the scene where she's explaining her masterpiece to two of the guys, layer by layer. So she says there's a layer of lady fingers, which is just like sponge cake. So there's lady fingers, there's jam, there's custard, which she made from scratch, raspberries, more lady fingers, beef sauteed with peas and onions, more <laughs> custard, bananas, and whipped cream on top. <laughs> so she's explaining this. Yes, there's there's her her trifle so she may get when she gets to the beef part the guys who she's explaining this to have this puzzled and a little terrified look on their face right because they know 
they're going to be the ones eating this thing. But they don't want to hurt her feelings. So they wait till she steps out of the room, and they examine the cookbook that she was using, and they realize that two of the pages were stuck together. Okay? So she made half of an English trifle, and she made half of a shepherd's pie. Right? So she was using the wrong recipe for half of it. Okay? So why am I telling this story? Well, we see Jesus' response to after just being questioned, after just being attacked. And also, Jesus, again, is in his last week of life. So he is really trying to hammer home why is he here and what's important for his ministry and in following God, like what really matters. And so in some ways, Jesus' response that we just read about could be summarized as Jesus saying, you're using the wrong recipe, right? Now stick with me here. The recipes the Pharisees were using for what it looked like to follow God, not all of the components were inherently bad, right? Prayer, not bad. In fact, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, Giving, not inherently bad. That's a good thing. Um, The Messiah coming from the line of David, that's a true statement. But there were some elements that Jesus is pointing to some beef sautéed with peas and onions, if you will, that made this trifle that on the outside may look very beautiful and delicious, um, but when you take a bite of it, it's a little off-putting, to say the least, right? So let's look at this passage and see what were some of those ingredients that Jesus says don't belong there, and what ingredients should they be replaced? So let me read, because there are kind of three sections to this passage. Um, So let me go through this kind of section by section, and we'll see see what Jesus is saying here. So in the first part, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? And he kind of leaves that as a rhetorical question here. And there are kind of two things that I just want to pull out of this that Jesus is getting that, getting at. One is this idea of um, the Messiah being the son of David. And so historically it was thought that if you have a younger generation coming down so like the generation coming from David that generation is historically lesser than the older generations that came before it so in this case when um, the Jews and um, the people at the time were thinking of the son of David And they knew, they knew from scripture and from prophecy that the son of David would be the Messiah. And that's true. Jesus does descend from the the line of David. But they're thinking of it as kind of a lesser than David. And so when Jesus says, you know, the son of David, but also he is Lord, that kind of contradicts their thinking at the time. So the older generation is greater than the younger, is kind of replaced by this idea, this theme that we see all throughout the Bible, that the lower is exalted over the higher. So we actually see this a little bit later as well. But Jesus is pointing to just because it's the son of David that is the Messiah does not mean that he is lesser than than David. Um, In fact, he is greater. He is Lord. And so this idea of lordship is another thing that Jesus is pointing at. And so it was a common misconception at the time also that the Messiah would come as this kind of militant king that would come and restore um, a political rule for for the Jews. They would overthrow the Romans who were um, oppressing the Jews at the time and that the Messiah would come, there would be this big battle and the Jews would win and have this occupancy over Jerusalem. But what Jesus here is also pointing at is that this isn't the concept of of Messiah that, that is reality, that is true. 
And so when he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, like Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And Jesus is not just this military king to come and restore the kingdom to Israel, like many of his even disciples thought, but he is Lord. Like, he's pointing at the fact that the Pharisees are missing these little hints throughout the Psalms, which this is referring to, and um, other parts of the Old Testament, where Jesus, the Messiah, is coming as the embodied form of God, not just this political ruler and political king. So this idea that the Messiah is Lord, is Lord. It's not just an earthly occupation. It has heavenly um, ramifications to this. So that's, that's that kind of son of David thing that David is, that, that Jesus is getting at in this first part of the passage. So then we look at the second part. So those are, those are some of the elements, the, the bits of, bits of beef, the Older isn't necessarily greater than the younger, and the Messiah is more than just this earthly, this earthly ruler on earth. Um, so the next part we see in verses 45, it says, When all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. So here we see Jesus pointing at kind of these outward appearances that are important to, to the Pharisees, to the teachers of the law. The long robes that Jesus is pointing to, um, in that time, long robes were indicators that people really didn't have to work for a living, because if you're wearing long robes, like, that would get in the way of your work. And so um, it was kind of a status symbol in some ways. The same thing with public greetings, good seats at the table. They were signs of distinction and superiority. And these lengthy prayers, which Jesus even calls out himself, he says they're, they're just for show. They're to try to show that they were pious, that they were the most religious because they could say these long, really um, just very superfluous kind of prayers. Um, but in the kingdom recipe, right, where Jesus is actually Lord, these things don't matter, Jesus is saying. Um, what behind it matters, which is where he's getting at. The heart behind things matters. And Jesus is pointing at, in this case, the heart behind what they're doing is actually not good. When he talks about they, they devour the widow's houses. Um, so at the time, the, the widows, the scribes were kind of tasked with taking care and supporting the widows. The widows were the least and most marginalized population in the community. Um, and so they were actually supposed to be serving the widows, but instead um, they would do things like um, take a large cut of, of um, money when they were managing their affairs. Um, the scribes weren't allowed to accept money for their teachings, but they could accept gifts, and so apparently some scribes were encouraging impressionable widows to make gifts that were bigger than the widows could actually afford. And so Jesus is saying, you're, you're devouring the widows' houses. You are, your heart is not in the right place. On the outside, you may think you're doing the right things. You say the long prayers, you wear the long robes, but like your heart is messed up. <laughs> it's not in alignment with Jesus. Um, and so we see Jesus pointing at the fact that our heart behind things really matters, and that's what he cares about. And so in our final illustration, we again see how God is correcting the ingredients in his recipe. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. 
All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So we see Jesus talking about how the rich are making their gifts. Um, Luke does not say so, but it implies that at least some of them were giving a lot of money generously. We would assume that if, you know, they're living out of wealth and opulence, they're, they're giving a little bit more. Um, and Luke specifically calls out the poor widow then. And it's interesting because all widows at the time were poor. And so by saying poor, he's almost saying this is like the poorest of the poor widow. And she gives two small copper coins. It said that that coin was like the smallest currency that they had at the time. It was worth about five minutes of labor at minimum wage. So if you, if you translate that to today's standards using federal minimum wage, that's about 60 cents. So he's saying that her basically, the amount of money that she had to her name was about, let's just say, a dollar and 20 cents. Not, not a lot. Um, and so if you can imagine, like for one of us to drop a penny on the ground, probably not hugely significant, right? I'm hoping that most of our net worths are more than a dollar and 20 cents. But for this widow to drop even a penny on the ground, that's a big impact to her, right? That's a big um, proportion to what she has. And so what Jesus is saying here is it's not the amount that matters, right? If you look at the amount, a dollar twenty compared to probably a much larger amount that the other people are giving, that's like her amount is much smaller than the actual amount that the others are giving. But Jesus says that she gave more. And so in the kingdom, in Jesus' recipe, God sees the sacrifice, right? And so he knows that that dollar and 20 cents, those two coins, is everything that the widow has. It's everything. And the amount of trust and sacrifice that that widow must have had to say, God, I am giving you everything everything with these two coins is what God cares cares about most. And so let's let's look. Let's look at these ingredients, right? So here's here's the trifle without without the beef sautéed with peas and onions. Um, so we see in Jesus's kingdom the lower is exalted over the higher. And we see this with the widow as well, right? So she was the lowest of the low, and yet Jesus says she gave the most. So she is exalted over those bigger gifts. The Messiah is Lord, right? The Messiah, which Jesus doesn't explicitly say in this passage, but he's pointing to, he's pointing to the fact that he is Lord, and he's coming as Lord, not just as this military king, but as Lord. Um, we also see that the heart behind what we do matters. So we, we see it's not just about those external pretenses. It's not just about how often we pray or how long we pray or how many times we've read the Bible, right? It's about our heart behind things that matters. And then we also see how God sees the sacrifice, so this passage specifically dealt with finances, right, with two, with two coins that the widow had. Um, but that, that um, applies to everything. God sees um, when we sacrifice our time. God sees when we sacrifice um, the things that he's calling us to steward um, and, and make, those, make those choices. So what, does this, so what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us today? Well, when we look at these four categories, these four ingredients, if you will, there's one that really stands out as the main ingredient, I would say, 
um, and the, uh, the other three kind of fall underneath it. And that is that Jesus is Lord. Right here, it's the Messiah, but we know that it's Jesus, um, that he is Lord. And I think all of these other three categories could kind of fall under that category of Jesus' lordship. So if Jesus is Lord, it affects how we treat others and the value that we place on them. Uh, it affects our heart posture and our motivations if we're surrendered to Jesus' lordship. And it affects our finances and how we approach giving, but also everything that we're called to steward. It's, it affects our time. It affects our resources. It affects our families. It affects our vocation. And Jesus is Lord over all of it. And if he is Lord, that affects the way that we live and the way that we handle all aspects of our lives. So I think as we think about this, for us, it naturally begs the question of, do you want Jesus to be Lord of your life? Are you all in? Like the widow who gave everything that she had, she said to God, what I have is yours. Lead me. And we have the opportunity to make that decision too. Some of us already have made that decision. Some of us maybe not. Um, but it is a question that we're confronted with. Do you want Jesus to be Lord of your life? And if the answer is no, we're really glad that you're here. And we just want to say that you're invited and welcome to be here for as long as you want to decide whether this is a choice that you want to make. Um, and if the answer is yes, if you have said yes, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life, we're also really glad that you're here. Um, but right now, we're going to press into that a little bit more in a second. Um, but we're actually going to take this time right now and take communion together as a time where we remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Um, but it's also this acknowledgement that he is Lord of our lives. And it's this act of surrender, really saying, I don't want to be the one leading God, I want you to be the one leading it. Um, so as we take communion together, I want you to think about that, about what does it mean for you to be Jesus, for Jesus to be Lord of your life. And so practically what that looks like, um, we have the elements up here. You can come up the center aisles. We have bread and juice. We have gluten-free. And you can take them back to your seats, and we'll take all the elements together once everyone has them back to their seats. So if that is something you would like to participate in, if you have said, yes, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life, whether today is the first time you're saying that or whether you've been saying that for 50 years, we invite you to come forward and, and take that with us.
took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me So for you, those of you who had said yes to Jesus being your Lord, for wanting Jesus to be your Lord, I invite you to think about your week coming up, right? Thanksgiving is this Thursday, Black Friday, it's Friday, we have to celebrate that. <laughs> but when you think about your week ahead, and we think about this concept of Jesus' Lordship, right? Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is actually Lord of our life, that affects things. So I just want to take a moment and give us some space to think about one area in your life this week that you want to be intentional about G inviting Jesus into. Maybe it's your finances. Thinking about Black Friday, you're like, steward those a little bit better this year. Maybe it's your family. Maybe you're like, man, I have some really complicated family dynamics that I'm walking into in a few days, and I just really need Jesus to show up in that space. Maybe it's your free time. You're like, I have a couple days vacation, and I really want and need to prioritize some rest and sleep, and I want to invite Jesus so what is one area that you specifically want to be intentional about inviting Jesus into this week, this week specifically? So let's just take a few moments and think about that. Think about your week. Think about a specific area. declarations just for us to silently say to Jesus that as we think about that area just to acknowledge again that Jesus is Lord over that area that he is moving that he is working and to be clear Jesus is Lord over all areas right and so but to acknowledge that this specific area that God is there and just asking him to help him partner with you this week in that area. So I don't know if you already did that, but um, if you didn't, there's 
those prompts behind me. So just you can silently say, Jesus, you are Lord over my whatever it is, finances, family, my free time, my vocation. And then to just simply ask him, help me to partner with you in my whatever that situation is. just do this now and forget about it, but to actually make note of this and to even every morning remember this and say, Jesus, you are Lord over my finances this week, over my family this week. Help me, help me today in this. Whether that would help you to write it down, put it on a sticky note on your mirror, something where you see it, something where you're reminded something where you remember and then to look back next Sunday and to see how you notice Jesus be with you this next week so I invite you to do that this week but for the rest of for the rest of this morning we always want to create space to respond to what God is doing and so if you would like prayer about one of these areas that you're asking God to help you with, we would love to pray with you. Whether that's someone you came in with, one of our leadership team, we would love to just bless what God is doing and ask God with you for help, for help in these areas. We all need help from Jesus. And so we just would love if you want prayer about that, to get prayer about that. And if there's anything else that you came in with that you would like prayer about, we would love to pray about those things as well. Um, so don't hesitate to get prayer if you want it. I'm just going to pray to close us for this morning. So Lord, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you that you are Lord of our lives. We thank you that you are with us. God, in every moment of every day, that you will be with us this week. And I pray that you would come and help. That you would come and help us turn our hearts towards you. That we remember that you are Lord over all aspects of our lives. And I pray that you would help us to partner with you this week. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. It was great seeing you all. Have a great week. Happy Thanksgiving.